Okay, Jonas. So this yeah. is uh, this is what number eight of these uh, transatlantic videos. Incredible. Yeah, I actually talked with my wife, and and she asked how long how long have you guys uh, been been up to this? And I I don't know. It has to be over a year. It's oh yeah, I think it was um like February or something like that last year we started uh, hey. thereabouts. So yeah, so we missed the awesome. anniversary, but uh, that's okay. We just we'll celebrate the fifth or something like that. So yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> All right, so so today, um, welcome everybody for and thanks for watching. And uh, today we're going to uh, again, as always, talk each of us about four different records, um, which of course the other person has. We have a, a little bit of a halftime show, which is we're each going to talk about our ten most valuable jazz. Uh, records which we own and as based on the median value on discog supposedly which is a bit deceptive because yeah. if you have a record which is so rare that there are actually no copies for sale and so on it's like sometimes the median value is quite low but if you ever if one of those actually did come up it would be you know even harder to get but anyway it's as good a measure as we have and then uh, we're also going to do something a little bit fun uh, suggested by uh, one of uh, one of my uh, regular viewers, maybe one of yours too, I'm not sure, Jonas uh, Maurizio, who suggested that we each select uh, a record using the random function yeah. on Discogs and no cheating, awesome. talk, about, no talk cheating. about that record. And we might cheat a bit because if it's a record that we have but haven't quite listened to yet, then we may move on. But, uh, but otherwise, it um, doesn't matter if it's the monkeys or the Beach Boys or what have you, we're, we're going to get into it. So... Okay, so uh, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about today, um, and I gave this a good listen. This is, uh, I mean, a classic, classic record, isn't it? Yes. Oh, um, Black Sabbath's self-titled debut record from 1970. Just so much, uh, I don't know. It doesn't get any better than this, in my opinion. What a fantastic record. What a fantastic record. Um, I, I have a first, I actually have a first um, German oh. uh, press on, on the Swirl label. So I want I wanted to find the first four or five uh, as early pressings as I, as I could. And I think I have one left or something like that that I just have a uh, 73 issue. So, okay. So uh, anyway, I, I, my relationship to this is that, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that I grew up with Black Sabbath because my dad didn't listen to Black Sabbath at all, but uh, I pretty quickly in my sort of, I don't know, when I was 11, 12, something like that, I started listening to a little bit heavier music and obviously reading magazines and stuff like that. Uh, Black Sabbath was always on lists and stuff. So I guess I, after I got on the CD or something like that, when I was in my early teens, started listening to them. So uh, in it's quite funny because in my mind, even now when I have grown up, uh, Black Sabbath's first record has always, in my mind, been uh, a, a bad production and very dirty in sound but it's the complete opposite isn't it it's so well produced and recorded it's just insane so what's your um, thoughts about uh, Sabbath yeah I mean well, that's so interesting to hear you, you talk about it that way I, I, I'm very similar I mean when I this and that this record was very much a part of me growing up um, with music and uh, although not until, again, I was probably, as you say, about 13 or so. Uh, when I was younger than that, yeah, I, my big four musical listens were, were the Beatles, Backman Turner Overdrive, ah, cool. Kiss, uh, and, and Antonio Carlos Jobim. Those are, those are the four musical uh, artists to whom I listened the most up until I was, what, age 12? For, uh, okay. Because I bought the records or because my parents had, in the case of the Beatles and Jobim, had the records. Um, and Sabbath, and so I mean, I like heavy rock and roll, right? But Sabbath always seemed like kind of scary out there. Is what the tough kids who were older than me with the long hair who smoked a lot of dope, who were kind of intimidating, right? Okay. What to listen to, you know, occasionally you hear it coming out of their car. What's that sound, you know? And and uh, and I and I so I was kind of Sabbath curious, I guess you would say. And then uh, 
And then I bought the first Sabbath I ever got was uh, was uh, we sold our souls for rock and roll, which Warner's put out without the approval of the band and so on. Right. And things were kind of going south in, in, in the later 70s. Mm. But it's an incredible compilation. Um, and it has a lot of the tracks on, on this album. But this album is amazing. And it's like, it's like, and one of the things, as you say, it sounds great. And one of the other pieces of kind of special sauce for this record is that, uh, is that Ozzy had a bad cold. So his voice sounds distinct from any other Sabbath record. Like uh, people often accuse Ozzy, uh, Ozzy of, of having so-called helium vocals, you know, like it's really high, mm -hmm. and chirpy kind of sounding. I personally yeah. don't think at all, but his voice. But uh, but his voice is much rawer and rougher hmm. on, on this yeah. record. Um, like you think about um, uh, uh, the song Warning, right? Like the, the tone, the yeah. hoarseness of his voice on that song. Uh -huh. And, and it's also like a, it's a record which is kind of, it's sort of slapped together. They had a few songs, but they also had, there's a whole bunch of stuff on here, which just sounds like Tony sitting at home in his, you know, in his, in his yeah. living room, just noodling and trying different stuff out. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, you, you can say it's filler, but it's very cool filler. You know, I mean, yeah, I yeah, it. it's awesome. I mean, it's 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 a fantastic. So I love Tony Iommi's uh, playing and riffing, obviously, and and a few solos that he he does. But in in my opinion, the main man on this is the drummer. I can't remember if it's Bill Ward or if it's uh, Bill Ward. Yeah, yeah, Bill Ward. Uh, his drumming is so jazzy; it really yeah. swings, yeah. like really yeah. swings. There's not one beat that is exactly the same as the other one it's he's the secret weapon and and it's funny they did that the reunion album called 13 a few years ago well yeah yes 10 years ago now wow um and that's actually a really good record uh if you've heard it but it but it has oh, i haven't heard no it's 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 really good because they it suffers a little bit from uh from the rick rubin sort of sound war stuff right so it's kind of it's 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 um well it's too loud as a record okay you could use, use a bit more white space in it um but uh, uh but the songwriting is great but the difference is and the drumming is fine but it's just not the same it ha doesn't have that kind of not totally stereotypical heavy rock drumming it's much as you say much more subtle and jazzy and people say like sabbath rhythm section swung right i mean yeah. In, in a yes jazz. yeah i totally agree anyway one of my absolute favorite records and and Unlike other records that I listened that I listened to a lot when I was thirteen or fourteen, and have you know, and and now really I'm not that motivated by anymore. I happen to listen to this record any day. I think it's I think it's timeless. Any age, it's just it's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. That, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop talking about it because we have uh, we have nine more records to get through. So <laughs> yeah, I can happily talk about that record all day long. Okay, so my turn, eh? So. What did we say? Oh, okay. Now, of course, I should have the records in my order, but I don't. One second. Let me pull it up. This is a record made by a group that doesn't get talked about much these days. Um, nope. They're kind of a big deal in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Um, but they uh, but they don't, you know, you really don't hear much talk about them anymore. And that is, of course, Humble Pie. And um, this is their third record called Humble Pie. Uh, uh, and it has this Tremendous artwork uh, on the cover and on the back as well. It's all very, uh, it's all very interesting. And I don't know, is yours a gatefold? Mine, I think mine is. No, yeah. this is. Uh, th this has to be like an eighties reissue or something because it has the. Oh yeah, with price code. Uh, yeah, I need yeah, a, well, a new. The gatefold has got the, a picture of the uh, band sitting in a cool. barn. Sitting in a barn, you know, which I guess is what bands did in the early seventies. Yeah, all every band member sat, sat in a barn all day. Long. Any any Guess Who record has this photo in it as well. Um, so those guys were from Winnipeg. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, it's a, their third record. I think it's their best record. I mm -hmm. would I would say. I mean, frankly, not being a, in any way like a like a humble pie completist. It's for me. This is all the humble pie you need. I used to have a bunch more humble pie. I got rid of some of them and I kept this one. The, the, the first two records, one is really, is kind of, it's bluesy, but still kind of rough and unpolished. And then they have a very kind of lighter country folky record where Peter, Peter Frampton's influence is much more prominent than Steve Marriott's. Because these, because what you have is, is, is Marriott, who's like the rough and ready blues rocker, right? And Peter Frampton is much more a singer songwriter, lighter touch, you know, more melodic sounds. And as ever, 
the combination of the two push pull attention the band makes for a great combination and, it, yes. and i think it's best articulated on this record, this is also Frampton's last record with the group. And, you know, there's some good moments on later records, but basically it's nothing but raunchy boogie rock after that. And it just gets kind of one dimensional. Um, and like Marriott, I think, don't get me wrong, great musician, but a whole record of, of just what Steve Marriott wants to play is not normally what I want to listen to. But a little bit of Steve Marriott here and there is great. I don't think there's a weak song in here. There's songs that I think are really great, like Only a Roach which that could, that could easily have been a Poco song. You listen to that, it could totally be like Loggins and Messina and, and, and those guys has exactly yeah. that US country rock sound, which is so prevalent at the time. But then the rest of them, you get all you, these, you know, good sort of boogie rock songs, um, Marriott, you know, with his great voice, that sort of rough voice and so on. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's, as I say, it's all the, humble pie you need but it's a great record and if you collect early 70s rock i think this is one of a record that has to be um in your collection in, I, in the collection yeah i agree i i agree um i haven't listened to this for so long and i have a copy that is water damaged also so i listened to this in my car we went to my mother-in-law's uh, house yesterday for a bite of eat and and uh, we listened to it <clears throat> up there and it's 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 a great record. Uh, I it deserves. Uh, I, I I deserve to have a better uh, version of it or a copy uh, of it. Uh, so I'll I'll try to to find a, a earlier one. How yeah, you, great. What do you like Frampton's voice? What do you think of? I'm not Frampton. Well, um, what do you think of Marriott's stuff on the record? Like the way which yeah, the, I, I, rougher bluesy I, stuff. I I think it's I, I'm on a um, I'm on a, a pretty hard blues kick right now. But I, I think it's, uh, I mean, of the songs that, yeah, but I'm not a, a, a Humble Pie. I don't think that I've listened to any more. This is the only Humble Pie record that I have in my collection also. So, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert of any means. Reminds me a bit, uh, too, of um, of uh, of the Almond stuff. Like, like, like some of the songs in here are not too dissimilar from, like, you know, the same sound that the Almonds had on Whipping Post, for instance, right? Like it's kind of yeah. rough, sort of throaty white man's blues right anyway good record yes now to one of my favorite records of all time oh yeah uh, you know you know by the way i should say i got this based on one of our conversations earlier on this when you were when you were recommending it and i'm like wow i have all these other joe ferrells but i don't have that one so i went out and sourced it after uh ah cool so anyway uh, that's awesome yeah uh, it's the uh, the joe ferrell uh quartet and i think that that was the original sort of uh uh title of it songs of the wind is that what they call the they they, they sort of uh, reissued it a couple of years afterwards uh, in the states and in germany uh, gave it another uh, cover artwork and i think it was called songs of the wind or something like that yeah, and also more uh, in the i think it even says like yo for el quit quintet featuring John McLaughlin and something like that because then by then he was one of the biggest guitarists in the world. Early pressing looks very looks like a nice glossy CTI early pressing. Yeah. It's beautiful. The, yeah. Uh, the 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 CTI uh the CTI uh covers and it, it, they're really well made. I, I I will give them that. Uh, I'm I'm not a huge CTI fan. To be honest, this is, a, I mean, in my opinion, the best CTI record that they produced because I love it so much. But um, I used to, back in the day, you could get CTI records for one, two euro. Like they were everywhere. And I bought a lot of them, but I've sold most of it, actually. So it's not like ECM where I kept a lot and that I'm pretty happy with today. But I'm I don't miss my CTI records. Mm. Uh, great lineup also: uh, Shikoria, Dave Holland, Jack Dijonet, and uh, John McLaughlin, and recorded in 1970. And this is, I mean, <clears throat> when I started really dabbling into jazz, John McLaughlin was, in a way, my sort of way into it. Mm. Um, the uh, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra and obviously also Bitches Brew but I mean the moment you go down that rabbit hole it's it, you you are you, you are screwed I mean because there are so much great music done in 
the early 70s and Joel McLaughlin is on everything his guitar playing is is uh, great so yeah fantastic record I think that the first record uh, don't know, uh, the first track on the first side is penned by Jan McLaughlin also yeah. but it has a different title compared to um, the song that he did on one of his I don't know if it's a Mahavishnu song or if it's a uh, one of his solo records, uh, but I think that it has another title. But you, the, the sort of the melody, you really, it's it's a distinct melody. I mean, I think, I mean, you could maybe add in like Wayne Shorter or whatever, but like this is this is almost like an all star fusion lineup, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Like Pharrell, yes. Korea, McLaughlin, Dave Holland, and and particularly Dejanet, right? And and I mean, we've talked about. We've talked about Bitches Brew. We've talked about Mahavishnu uh, together, and and you know, and this is one of the areas where regular viewers were no, you know, we divide. You're much more kind of pro fusion. I I'm I I dabble a bit, but I'm not that keen. And 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 I have to say, of the work that some of these guys have done, with the exception of Korea, I'm not really a huge fan of. of oh, okay. Sort of, I mean, like like I find, um, well, this let's put it this way. I find most sort of jazz rock fusion records just don't work for me. And, mm -hmm. and, this, and this is one that, that does, and, 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 or at least for the most part does. And I think the reason is because on a lot of this record, the rhythm section stays at home, yeah. lays, down, yes. lays down the beat and you can, and, 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 and these songs really swing as opposed to like, normally, frankly, I'll just say when Jack Dijonet is drumming, for me, it's like he's trying to offer like a sonic rendition of like the D-Day landings, like underneath the song, or he's, or it's like someone's taking the cutlery drawer and is rattling it. You know, there's just there's so much going on, and and, it, and it's it's and I don't think the production helps in some. On, and there's a couple of tracks that are like this um, on here, like um, I, I forget. There's like like circle in the square. Um, it's okay. The song motion, I, like I can't sit through that. Like for me, it's hard. Ah. Okay. Life is too short to listen to that because it's <laughs> so cacophonous that I don't, I can't hear the music in there right now, which is just me. Uh, lots of people love it, but that's how, that's how I feel. However, okay. there, there are other songs in here that are absolutely beautiful and so varied. So follow your heart, molten glass. Those are both the songs that open each side are great. Alter ego is a little, a little song, I think, but it's lovely. A song of the wind, which I guess is the song, what they eventually retitled the album. That's a beautiful yeah. track. Um, yeah. And even, and I get kind of when I see uh, when I see uh, song titles with the word collage in them, I get a little anxious because I feel like okay, I'm off to see like a John Cage retrospective at the MoMA, and and it's not going to go well, kind of thing. Okay. Um, uh, but but actually, but collage for Polly is also I think it's a pretty cool track. Even so, so it's like I think there's something in here for everybody. Do I like it all the way through? No, I don't. But I think there's some really great tracks in here. I was actually surprised by how much I liked some of the music on this record it's you know I'd, I'd go into this record for this track or that track I wouldn't listen to yeah. it all through but uh I can see I could to see someone with with kind of more your taste why this would be like this top of the heat for you it's, it's, yeah yeah it's it's should, a brilliant yeah. uh, brilliant record in my opinion and and it's still cheap I think too I I don't know the sort of the discogs uh value on it I'm trying to see now but I think I, you can get it. I think you can get a decent copy for 15 bucks or less for sure yeah I think so too probably like, less you know, and I mean, uh, we won't dabble. Yesterday was record store day, and I I saw some of the prices on these releases. Uh, I mean, I'm so glad that I I I I'm, I have no interest in it. Like really, no interest in record store day. Um, and for those who have, I mean, it's awesome for for them. But I saw some some of the prices like 50, 60, 70 euro for a uh, ordinary double LP. It's just like crazy and here you can find a 40 50 year old record for 15 bucks in perfect condition and it will blow your just, mind i just did a video on this very topic on, on i think and, and i think you had done one as well similarly around uh around sort of finding value in the market and so on and not getting sucked into these big these uh these big prices um the only the only record store day just just take a little sidebar on record store day um uh, which I've never been, I've, it's never really lodged in my brain, Record Store Day, so I've never really been one of these people lining up at, at, at things. But again, I'm glad that people do it. I'm glad it's good for record stores. That's great. The only title of this this year's that I'm sort of intrigued by is the is the reissue of the Chet Baker um, record. Mm -hmm. um, but 
Um, usually what happens with these, you know, these, these sort of high end all analog uh, reissues is uh, I wait for the first flurry of purchasing to happen on, uh, and, and then I'll look on Discogs. There's usually a whole bunch of guys complaining about no fill and, and they had to clean the record, you know, and, and et cetera. I mean, for, which is always, I mean, no fill thing is a different thing, but I feel like a lot of people are very unrealistic about what vinyl records actually are. They expect, yeah. I mean, I don't remember ever buying a vinyl record and it being, I mean, in recent years, I have actually heard a few of these kind of the like super silent, you know, sort of Kevin Gray type. And I go, wow, because vinyl records back in the day never sounded that silent. They were, nope. you know, they were always a little bit, you know, there'd be a couple of pops here and there kind of thing. You just, you know, you didn't care because that's what vinyl records were. Yeah. But there's a lot of obsessing about the minutiae of, uh, oh, I had to clean it with a brush first. Oh, okay. Well, and then, oh, my spindle hole. There's a whole subsection of people who are very upset about spindle holes. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't worry. So I wait for all that to die down. Then usually you can tell, okay, you know, the majority says, oh, this is actually a pretty good record. You guys are just, yeah. Not yeah, yeah, I've, I've bought a, a bunch of, of record store day releases also, but but mostly online afterwards. Yeah. And I, I saw an interview with a guy here in Sweden, and he said that he this was the first year that that he isn't participating because he loses um, roughly like a, a thousand euro each year in the record store day releases alone because it's so hard they, they are so expensive and it's so hard to, to guess which ones will sell so he's well, just he's ending up uh, having a big stock of some of the titles and he has to um, like give it away uh, eventually because they don't sell okay sorry yeah so he's a retailer that I, I could understand that i said so, there's a guy Beat Street Records is a good record store in Vancouver, and and I he I was following that guy's social media, and he had a whole I don't know what the record was, but he had a whole wall sort of devoted to it, you know. And I thought, well, I you know I hope that pans out, right? And you flog those, yeah, it's, it's uh, a lot of money. Yeah, it is a lot of money. Um, and I, I don't know what option there is to you know to send back the you know the the uh, oh no, no, there is none. You have to you have to you I think you buy it up front also so there's nothing like but I I I, I don't know this uh, so I won't but but um, anyway 15 euro for this in like near mint condition sounds fantastic some of the best playing uh, ever I mean it, this is I, I I like this uh, exactly if, if you're a fusion fan it's a must-have I would say and yeah. I say that, yes. I say that as, a, as a fusion dabbler but it's it, it is even for me it's a great record so yeah Okay. Um, so, so, stones. Yes, yeah, stones. So, I actually, this is the first time I think I think in our um, history where I managed to see that I, I've sold my stones record, so I don't have it. Oh, okay. uh, I listen to it. I listen to it, but okay. I don't have it. Uh, okay. well, so our two two lists didn't uh, sync up this time. So is it no well, okay? Is a notable record then? Because here I am with uh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going on the on last uh, July's list. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah, and and wow. uh, I've listened to it also. I thought that I had it, but I don't. And I remember is, I sold well, it just uh, last time. I I sold uh, a bunch of records. So I I listened to it digitally uh, in my car yesterday. So I know the record, but I don't have the copy. So this incidentally is the first record so far today, which is not titled after the group. Um, so we had, yeah. we had uh, Sabbath yeah. by Sabbath, Humble Pie by Humble Pie, and the Joe Farrell Quartet by the yeah. Joe Farrell Quartet. So this is the Stones diminishing their own uh, diminishing their own product by calling it only rock and roll. You know, re reviews of this are uh, kind of all over the map. Um, I consider it to be one of the lesser appreciated but better records for the Stones in the seventies. Um, it's uh, and in fact, I listened to it a lot. A lot, uh, probably between uh, 1980 and 1983. I listened to this record a ton, hmm. and uh, it and it is uh, like a like a good football game. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a record of two sides, right? It's of two halves. So the first side, I think, is all world. I I think it's uh, you know I mean if you, it's nothing but bangers, right? The first, of course, I can't find the song title to get in, in the right order. Um, yeah, if you can't rock me, which is a which is a great opener. Ain't too proud to beg, which is maybe their best ever one of their best ever Motown covers. Um, it's only rock and roll, like the title track, which is which is you know one of their great great songs. 
Uh, Till the Next Goodbye is is a beautiful ballad, and as so is Time Waits for No One. That's like, it's it's sort of like all the best parts of Tattoo You sort of distilled into one into one side, right? When and not unsurprisingly, because a lot of Tattoo You was recorded around this time, this time too. The second side is is a, I think really kind of up, up and down, and it has it, it's weird. You see, sometimes you'll read reviews of this record and you'll say, oh luxury which is a song which starts side one or side two. Oh, that's a great early reggae experiment it just baffles me the only thing which is reggae about that song is mick jagger's really shitty jamaican accent that he's putting on <laughs> right oh, and, yeah. and it's like it's sort of you know the stones and i don't want to get come over all too pc on this but like the stones you know made a career out of sort of verbal blackface right yeah. i mean you know yes. i mean that's, not all the time but some of the time um, and, and that's about as judgy as I'll get on it, but this is one of the worst examples where, you know, and you know, Sting does this shit too, but like suddenly there's, you know, there's uh, Mick Jagger trying to sound like a Jamaican guy. Like, why is he doing this? This is ridiculous. Yeah, why? Right. Um, and, and it's, uh, but otherwise that song is basically like an outtake from Exile Main Street, right. Is what it sounds like with, with a, with a Jamaican voice over top. So I personally find it a bit cringy. Some people love it. You're feel free to love it, but that's just my that's my experience of it. Um, and then, uh, but you know, and then there's there's some other decent songs in there. And then, but the highlight aside too, I think is Fingerprint File, which has it's so some of the disco beats they were going to use later in the decade. Um, it's one of the only Stone songs that I can think of that has wah wah guitar. Where I'm, where I'm assuming that was uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that was um, uh, Mick Taylor, but I'm not. I can't be certain. Maybe okay. it was Keith um and yeah and that's a and that's a kind of a, a good example of the stones borrowing from black musical traditions like that song i think um as opposed to you know luxury which is just kind of cringy i figure for file i think is one of the kind of little unheralded gems in their catalog as a, as a song so i really like it i mean i, I i'd uh, i'd recommend it to anybody you know if you're going to buy 10 stones records i say make this make this one of them um mm -hmm. and uh you know i think it's i think it's pretty strong what what are your views of it I, I sold it. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like it at all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it at all. And I, I actually, uh, I, I, when I listened to it yesterday, I, I, I sort of like, shit, this is the part of the Rolling Stones that I don't like, that I don't, I, I, I hate when they went the disco sort of way. Right. And uh, I feel like Ain't Pride to Beg is an okay song. And also, uh, it's only rock and roll. It's also a decent song. It's one of the most famous songs that they made, but I don't feel that it doesn't go anywhere. Like it's I'm sluggish waiting for it. To... Excuse me. It's a bit sluggish as a song. Uh, um... Yeah, it's a bit sluggish as a song. Yeah. Uh, so, so no, I, I don't enjoy this uh, record at all. But right now, I, I, I'm a little bit fed up with Rolling Stones because I bought this huge mono box set. Yeah, yeah. So I've been going through. Uh, both the, the UK and the US versions of all the early uh, records. So right. right now, Rolling Stones for me is just like, uh, I actually listened to their Satan Majestic's request again uh, not too long ago. And it's the anti-Rolling Stones record, as we talked about when we, yeah, yeah. we showed it last time. So, and I thought it was fantastic. It was just what I needed. <laughs> so so I, maybe that has something to do I, with it. It's with funny. Stones. I mean, I'm a huge Stones fan, and but I, I, would, I would be comfortable making a case for their best ever LP um, being Some Girls. Which is probably oh, my, shit. Is probably okay. one of my least favorites. No, for me, that is one of my. If I had to take only ten records with me somewhere, that would be one of the records. I oh would, my god! Yeah. Okay. So I, I absolutely love yeah. it. So, so we, we, are, know, we are far apart on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah, I love the, awesome. I love the early stuff too. But I mean, you know, yeah. like I love Sticky Fingers. That's one of my. That's one of my favorite records as well. But uh, but I really love that uh, some of the late seventies stuff. And and I know that's yeah. polarizing for a lot of people. But yeah, isn't that interesting? Eh? Yeah, yeah. I love my my favorite record is Exile on Main Street. I think that's a a, a, a perfect record. Like, uh, and I love all the sort of the stories behind it. And I mean, I've seen all the documentaries and, and stuff like that. So that's uh, the peak of Stones for for me. Uh, but some girls, I actually have some girls uh, in my collection. I haven't sold that yet. Uh, don't hang on to it, man. That's a classic. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, me... cool. Uh, let's go to 1957, I think, in the birth of uh, uh, yeah. uh, Birth of the Cool with uh, Miles Davis, a compilation record. 
And this is actually, uh, if not the first, it has to be an early US press that I got um, in pretty shitty condition, actually. From 19, no, no, the press from 1968. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, yeah, I, I revisited this um, yesterday also. And I don't know if it's me right now not really listening to this kind of music, uh, this er early uh, jazz. Uh, but I don't know, some of the tracks are, or most of the tracks are, are classics, but like Budo really um, uh, took a, a hold of me this time. But other than that, it's just, yeah, played through, really. Yeah, it, it's a, it's interesting, isn't it, this record? It's, um, I have, a, I have, this is like an early 60s capital. Um, this is the second version of the cover. Ah, cool. Uh, so I when... Seen that. I think they've been, I'll hold it up a little bit closer. Hang on. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Somebody has colored in Miles' cigarette with, with a ballpoint pen, and it's covered with, with someone else's marginal notes and so on, which are all kind of cryptic. Um, I like that. <laughs> and so on. Um, it's, uh, it, it's really interesting because, I mean, this, there's some legendary people playing on here. A lot of them, yes. well before they're famous, like Jerry Mulligan's all over here. Lee Conus is all over here. Um, yeah, my coach. Um, and a lot of what uh, happens from this, when I first listened to this record, uh, about it was about, well, I don't know, uh, half a dozen years ago, I guess, and or maybe longer actually. But and I at the time I kind of dismissed it. And I think my review of it, which I reviewed it on the channel, and I think I was a bit dismissive of it because I, 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 I think I said at the time it sounded big dandy to me, and I and and that was more a reflection of my own ignorance really about jazz because at the time um, because. Um, what this is is it's kind of a halfway house between the big band stuff that was happening and the bebop stuff which had had was rejecting that but the bebop stuff was so um wild and frenetic what you hear on this i now and this if you listen to a lot of the contemporary record stuff and the pacific jazz stuff from the 50s that happens a few years later driven by people like like uh like uh jerry mulligan and shelly mann and people like that uh there you could hear a lot of the kind of very arranging focused arrangement focused kind of music that you hear on here and, and this now having listened to all that stuff you know like Lenny Niehaus and people like that having listened to all that stuff in recent years going back to this record it now makes a lot more sense to me about ah, okay how this really was kind of a like a like a the seed for so much of the west coast not all of the west coast stuff but some of the west coast stuff um mm. but i i still feel it's probably more important for its place in history than it is a great record. The music is good, but I like the things that came from it more than I like it itself. I would yeah, say. I think I, I think that's uh, the same with me. If I picked Ten Miles Records, I wouldn't uh, take that with me. Uh, no, probably not, eh? And it, it's not. And in some respects, it's also it's a Miles record. Yeah, but it's this. He's one of a collective here, really. He's one of the yep. big driving forces. But he's one of a collective. Lee Konitz is also a big part of this. Mulligan is a big part of this as well. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Anyway, but cool record cool. though. Yeah, I recommend, recommend it obviously. But um... you love jazz and you want to understand it. It's a good it's understand jazz. It's a good record to have, I would say. But where are we at now? Still. Um, jazz more again. jazz. Are you doing? You're talking about Sunny, or is it my no, turn? You're you're talking about Sunny. Okay, so I am. Sorry, I talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I forgot actually your segment. I apologize, Jonas. This is the way no, I, no, I, okay. like it. I have I haven't prepared that much. So uh okay. So here we have uh the bridge, Sonny Rollins. I have to hold this carefully because my copy is split. This is a this is an original 62 um ah, cool on pressing. Here, let me just just here's let's let's nerd out a bit. I'll just here's my there's the uh there's the uh, oh shit, that's nice. There's a the deep groove. It's actually in pretty good condition, I will say. Much better than the sleeve, which, as I say, mm -hmm. is split fore and aft here. But uh, anyway, yeah. pop there. Um, this this was actually a record which I got in an auction lot, um, which I bought the whole box of records for like thirty bucks, and it was in, in like hundred records, and this was that's one. That's nice. Yeah, so that was kind of fun. Um, and I didn't actually realize how great a thing that was for, for several years afterwards. This is a famous record. Uh, because of course he'd taken three years off and he and it's called the bridge because he had taken three years off from performing and recording well i don't know about from performing but from certainly from recording and he and most days he'd gone onto the williamsburg bridge 
in New York and sat literally in the, in the kind of the beams of the bridge in a hidden away place and just played saxophone for three years. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if he did the coldest days of the year, but, but, but most days he did it. This, so, you know, one of a number of sabbaticals he took in his life or has taken, I should say, in his life. And because uh, he's still with us, as far as as far as I recall, when it was when it first came out, again it was a return to recording, and it didn't get very great reviews at the time. It's gone on to be to receive a retrospectively a much higher critical appraisal. But I'm actually kind of in the camp of the original reviewers on this one. I I think I think for a guy who took three years out, right, and you know, when all when amazing things were happening in jazz, right, you think about people like Eric Dolphy and Coltrane and 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 yep. people like that are doing in this period of time. He comes back. Not only do I find this kind of lacking energy, this record, it, 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 I also think he sounded better before. Like, here's the stuff that he was doing in the two or three years for his sabbatical. Way Out West, Sonny Rollins and the Contemporary Leaders, Saxophone yeah. Colossus, Sonny yes. Rollins Plus Four, but the stuff he did with Brown and Roach, right? That is all world. In 1959, he could make a good case to be the best saxophone player on earth. Yes. I don't think that's true here. I think he's, I, not only has he been eclipsed by other people, I think he's, I think he's, uh, frankly, he's, he's, it's a very low key and subpar performance. I think he's not helped by the fact that he's got, that the lineup includes guitar and, and there's not another horn to play off and, and there's not a piano. Um, so some of the dynamics that might, might give him a better platform aren't there. Weird thing is Jim Hall was making great records with Paul Desmond at the same time. He has made six records or so with Paul Desmond that are, that are, that are fantastic. But here yeah. he just, he seems comatose, right? Rollins yeah. was better than Jim Hall, but but it's uh, you know, and so there's, you know, there's some nice moments on here. Like the side two, I think is better. Like the title track is good. There's lots of interesting things, you know, in in, in the bridge and like melody and in rhythm. They, they mix it up a bit. Um, yeah. I, I, God bless the child. I think is pretty good. I don't. I don't think it's like a you know, a super highlight. Uh, once again, Hall just like sucks all the oxygen out of the studio. I think when he when he when he when he comes in. If if I were to review this, I, it would do well to get three and a half stars out of me. Mm -hmm. um, I, and maybe I just heard it on the wrong day, but I just felt it. I just kept waiting for this record to come alive. And yes. this other stuff. And for me, it just doesn't. What do you think of it? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. Like I, uh, the bridge was one of the first sort of records that I I listened to with Sonny Rollins. And I wasn't impressed. Like I really wasn't impressed. It's it's uh, so I, it took me a while to really discover Sonny Rollins, and uh, I had to go back in his catalog to really appreciate appreciate uh, uh, Ten of Madness and uh, Saxophone Colossus, fantastic records. But uh, just like you, this is, I think it's a good record. Yeah. But this is hailed as one of the best records in history of jazz, and I don't get it. Like, I really don't get it. And as you say, three years sabbatical playing 12 hours under a bridge. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, I think that you can hear that there are a lot of ideas, but I don't think that it really goes through. But it's a very famous and a well known record. So I'm probably the one that is wrong, but that's how I feel. <laughs> I, I could, well, I could be, well, and what, you know, what's right, what's wrong. It's just our, no, 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 that, that's obviously. I actually, I, I, I just uh, last week I did an interview with uh, Adrian uh, Levi, uh, Levy, who, who has um, written the biography of uh, Sonny Rollins just really? now, like 700 pages uh, biography. Came out in December, I think, or January. That video up now? No, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably Tuesday or Friday, something like that. I will uh, have it up. But we had a fantastic, like almost an hour uh, long conversation because he he uh, he's written books by um, uh, first Lou Reed and then Patti Smith, right? And now with Sonny Rollins, took him seven years to write it. Wow. Uh, fantastic! So the the stories he he uh, told, uh, amazing. I bet. I bet. Well, that's, anyway, that's uh, yeah. So, so there we are. That's uh, I, I mean, I, for me, this, this comes down to there's not much click between the two main melodic instruments. You know, they they, they don't seem they seem to be existing in separate spaces and that and that, mm -hmm. and that also all the energy kind of dissipates. But uh, alrighty, so uh, yeah. So I don't what, know. We have two records left. Should we do some sort of the? Oh, that's uh, right. We're rattling through, don't we? Yeah. Why don't we do? Should we do our? Uh, should we before we do our last two records? Should we do our, um, our, our, our top 10 jazz? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. 
Should we do uh, every other or should one? Well, well, you, you go first. You do your top 10, then I'll do my yeah. top. I think I pulled like eight. So it's not a uh, top 10, but, uh, and I'll go to my Discord so I can uh, let you know the sort of the medium value. Uh, but my, I have, I mean, my va most valuable records in my collection is my psych records. And I thought that I had sort of more valuable jazz records than I, that I, than I did. But uh, this is the most valuable record in my jazz collection. I love Supreme, uh, first U.S. press. Wow, nice. It crackles when you open it. Beautiful. Look at that. It's that is in gorgeous. Fantastic condition. And... I got it for a uh, hundred bucks, so so it's still a, a great price. But it wasn't like you know a euro record. I had to pay pay up for it. But uh, the median today is uh, two hundred and eighty euro. Yeah, I would think so. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm and I'm so glad that I actually pulled the trigger on it uh, because it's one of the best jazz records in my opinion. Those early uh, those, those early, early Van Gelder pressings, right? Just always to sound. So yeah, sounds cool. fantastic. And this here, you can argue about the medium price because this is in I shit you not, it's in like near mint condition. Like I I I can't you get a lot more for that for than that. For uh, it. yeah, I mean I would get a lot more than the medium value. I can't see that there are many copies in this condition still left in the world. You know, um, but moving on to to uh, the second most valuable jazz record is a Swedish jazz record uh, by Börje Fredriksson, uh, Quartet and Quintet. This is a 200 euro record. Uh, it's on the Blue Columbia and it's a, a, a Swedish record. You have Paul Danielsson and Bobo Stensson on this, which is, uh, I think, international more known uh, with their ECM stuff that they did, but also Albert Heath. Uh, Börje Fredriksson, he didn't do many records. I think that this is the only one that he did uh, while he still were alive. Uh, fa fantastic saxophone player uh, took his What's life. What's the name of the artist, Jonas? What's the name of the artist? Sorry. Uh, Börje Fredriksson. Börje okay. Fredriksson. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Uh, check this out. This is this is fantastic. It definitely has that Scandinavian sort of, of sound to it. Uh, and musicianship is great, like really great. Uh, moving on to the third most valuable is Belladonna, uh, Iron Car. And this is a first UK uh, press on the Vertigo Swirl. In, again, in fantastic condition. I'm so glad that I could pick this up when I, when I did. Uh, I paid like 100, uh, 100 euro for this too. Uh, but so worth it. Iron Car, one of my favorites in jazz. Have you heard Belladonna? Never, never, ever, ever. Oh, shit. You have to hear this. This is uh, the English uh, Bitches Brew. Okay. Really? Like, I, I think that that's a, pr a pretty dumb description of it. But yeah. check it out. Check, okay. check no, it out. No, no, no. It's an intriguing description, so for sure. I tried. I tried my best. <laughs> uh, the next one is actually, uh, uh, what, what is it called? It's called uh, Music Matters. Yeah. So this is from 2014. It was actually given to me by a VC member, a, a vinyl community nice. uh, member called Paul Baraka P. Dub. Yeah. He sent this to me. He had two copies. Very nice of him. And this has just skyrocketed, like many of the of the Music Matters. Um, yeah, it's a high copies. end issue, high end all analog reissue. Yeah. Yeah, and of all records, it's nice to have this in uh extremely good sounding um version. Uh I forgot to say it's 180 on uh, Belladonna and 150 on uh, on something else, uh, Euro. Wow. And then we have a Swede again. This is a pop workshop. I don't know if I've shown this before in our in our sessions, but this is the second one, Pop Workshop Volume uh, 2, or Song of the Protrictlodite, something like that. I guess that that's a dinosaur name. Uh, so you have Tony Williams on this, on drums, and then you have uh, two Polish guys called Vlodek Gulgowski and and then you have Mads Winding and uh, Janne Schaffer. Janne Schaffer is a Swedish guitarist, really, really good. Wow. Um, I did an interview with him 
six months ago, something like that. That's up. But the story behind this is pretty funny because Sweden has always done these collaborations with all, with other uh, countries. So we have had uh, during the seventies a few really really cool collaborations. And and uh, Pop Workshop Volume One had Ed Tigpen playing the drums. But for the second uh, installment, because this is really the two Polish guys are the two. Uh, main men here they are the sort of the in, they took the initiative for these pop workshops yeah. but uh, the producer was able to uh, get tony williams to drum now the most popular guy at this time were uh, Bill, billy cobham so they wanted billy cobham to play on it but he he couldn't he, he was uh, occupied so so uh, they had to to sort of uh, settle with tony williams so Tony Williams came to the to the uh, session here in Sweden, and uh, for some unknown reason, he got uh, to know that they wanted Billy Cobham. So he was super pissed. So he is playing his heart out here. Okay. One of the best. Um, it's like listening to Tony Williams play like Billy Cobham yeah, yeah, on yeah. this really yeah. hard hitting, wow. really hard hitting. And uh, afterwards, the, the producer went, uh, took him to the airport, and it said that uh, he asked for an autograph, which he got. And when he looked at it afterwards, it was signed Billy Cobham <laughs> instead of, of uh, uh, Tony Williams. So a pretty funny uh, Excellent. story. Uh, the next one is Van Trosingen. This is also Swedish. Uh, notes from the underground. Uh, 130, 150 maybe uh, euro on this one. Double LP set. This will never be uh, reissued because uh, it starts on the first side with theme from Piano Concerto number two in C minor, uh, Op. 18. Uh, it's a Rashmaninov song that yeah. they do a, sort of a cover of for six minutes. And they didn't have the rights to, to use that. And I don't know if they got sued or something like that. So the only reissue of this is the CD without that song. Oh, okay, okay. So it's okay. it's uh, it's sort of famous here in Sweden for not be ever being. It's got, never going to be uh, reissued. Um, this is fantastic. Seventies uh, jazz at its uh, best. The next one is also Swedish, and this last two is Swedish record. So my most valuable records in the jazz category is. Uh, mostly Swedish. This oh. is Ibis. This is a fusion record, like that sort of almost like funky fusion. Uh, awesome. not, not funky fusion, but it definitely like soulful fusion from very sort of uh, a, a product of its day. Let's just say that. So 120 euro. It's from the same um, label as the Pop Workshop. And I, I got that for I mean, I, I didn't pay much for those those records compared to what, where to go for now. And my last one that I'm going to show you, and this is actually the one that I bought on my honeymoon. So even if I want it, I can't sell it because it has too much emotional value. Uh -huh. uh, this is Schizo by uh, Bernd Egerbart Trio, also Swedish. Very uh, uh, bad sounding pressing, not uh, the copy, but the pressing itself is known of being uh, very bad sounding. It was released with this sort of PVC plastic um, thing. Uh, it's very rare that this is still left, uh, but it ruined the record. So the, all the gases from these PVCs ruined the records back in the day. Great jazz. Very nice. Very that's cool. my that's my picks. Okay. Now I'm excited to see yours. I'll rattle through mine. Now, most of these are impulses. Not all of them, but most of them. So uh, ah, cool. I'll go from 10 down to 1. So uh, this one uh, is uh, Michael mm. White, Land of Spirit and Light, which is a great fusion-y, spiritual kind of, again, another record very much of its time, early 70s record. Mm. Um, I haven't listened to it as much as I would have liked. I've only really spun it once. I really liked it, but I haven't had the time to get back to it because I only, only picked it up a few months ago, um, which uh, these days will set you back 125. Uh, I, for the most part, I did not spend what these are, are worth, which for which mm -hmm. I'm... Um, next, number nine, Archie Shep. I'm a big Archie Shep fan. 
This is Attica Blues, his yeah. uh, record he did nice. about the prison riots um, in whatever it was, 1972. Great, great record. Like a lot of Archie Shep records, really diverse. Lots some R&B, jazz, all kinds of stuff in there. Now will cost you $111.27, apparently. Uh. Um, number eight. I'm also, as you know, a big Pharaoh Sanders fan. This is Pharaoh Sanders' record. Uh, uh. One of his la last things, if not the last thing he did for Impulse, 1974. You can tell they no longer did the glossy covers then, um, but it is a nice, uh, nice gatefold. There's Pharaoh ah, cool. Elevation, um, and uh, again, it's, it's typical Pharaoh stuff, right? He kind of got into a groove. The things he did with with Impulse are all there is some progression. They're all largely of a piece, and it's 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 very it's very typical. I wouldn't actually say it's one of his best Impulses, um, but it's, it's certainly very good. Um, hmm. And that's like 115 bucks, supposedly. Now here is an absolute classic, which would appeal to anybody. Um, this is a, uh, this is the Ellington, yeah. 1963 Japanese, first Japanese pressing on King Records. Um, so there's all the Japanese uh, text on the back. Um, beautiful condition cover, beautiful condition uh, uh, record. Um, and, and really just a fascinating record with these two, titans right from different eras kind of almost kind of shadow boxing with each other a little bit through the, the this record I, I i think it's it's just a really riveting it's a beautiful record and a really riveting record uh, at the same mm. time um and uh yeah this it would now cost you about 120 bucks to pick that up supposedly next another impulse so that's uh what is that one two three four impulses in a row here's a fifth uh which is oh shit yeah yep magic of mm. juju now, uh, when I put this, uh, when I reviewed this record and I put this cut, this uh, cover on the thumbnail, YouTube uh, tried to take the video down because this is apparently promoting death and violence and, and so on. So I have to be careful. Yeah, about. definitely. If one is free jazz curious, mm -hmm. this is an absolutely brilliant place to start because the, si the title track, the, uh, of, which is all of side one, is this, you know, you get African drumming and then Archie just ripping. And, but in a really fantastic and, and musical way, even though it's, it's, it's completely free. I love this record. I think it's, I think this is a repress, I think. Um, um, no, no, it's a, well, no, I don't think it can be. Anyway, we'll see. I'll have to figure out exactly. I, it says here that it's a 67 US first press. I don't think it can be because it's not glossy. So I'll have to check that again. Anyway, um, but it will go for like 125 bucks. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a great record. Definitely. Here's the first I'm so jealous. I'm so uh, jealous of Eden Pulse. Uh, oh, you, well, the, uh, that is a record worth worth going and seeking and, and breaking the budget for. It's so good. Okay, the first non-impulse. Um, Benny Golson's New York Scene. This is a, a contemporary. It's a 1958 U.S. first pressing. Um, six months ago, I got this for 40 bucks in a shop in Vancouver. It's uh, It would cost you 130 bucks to buy on Discogs. Uh, ah. So I was like, holy shit, I'm buying that when I, when I saw it in the store. And uh, it's one of the... There were a limited, very small number of impulses, oh, sorry, of contemporary records, which are actually not recorded out in LA by Les Koenig, but were done in, um, in New York. Um, this <laughs> is one of them. Um, and uh, uh, I forget who the engineer is here. Um, uh, yeah, Nat Hentoff actually is a producer. Ah, okay, cool. So um, great, great record. Um, and, uh, and, and, and again, like almost anything contemporary from the 50s worth acquiring. Okay, another non-impulse record. This was a gift from a friend. Um, it's Gabra Zabo's uh, ah. Dreams, which was, I think, the first record he put out on the label that he and Gary, uh, what's his name, McFarland, um, created called Sky Records. It's a, it's a, it's a gatefold with all kinds of trippy, oh, nice. trippy art um, all over it. This is typical Gabra Zabo. It's jazz, but pop inflected. It's, it sounds beautiful. It's just really. It's very 1968. Um, hmm. It's an incredible record, and it's uh, this goes for like 150 bucks. Hmm. Hey, okay, now we're down to the top three. <clears throat> Number three is not an impulse record. It is a record on milestone. Is on milestone. It is uh, Joe Henderson, yeah. The Elements, with uh, nice. Ellis Coltrane. So this is this is kind of you know it's a continuation from like uh, journey and satcha dananda uh, to a degree although uh pharaoh's not on here um but uh um but charlie hayden plays bass Alice coltrane mm -hmm. piano henderson of course on tenor um michael white who of course was on the, the earlier record or the, mm -hmm. was the, the leader of the earlier record 
and Kenneth Nash on uh, drums and percussion. Anyway, tremendous record, right in this yeah. whole sort of spiritual jazz um, lane. The impulse, uh, the impulse in particular, was so good at. That's not an impulse record. Number two is. <laughs> Is a love supreme. This is not a 1964 first press. This is, I think, well, it's it's it's, it's the it's the second stereo pressing. It comes out in like 1967 or thereabouts. I bought this based on people's comments about the sound, uh, and they were not wrong. This particular pressing, you just feel like you're there with the group in the Van Gilder studio. I'm sure that may be true of other pressings, but I I don't feel a need to buy any other copies of this record. This is just lovely. And I think it, it looks beautiful. It is. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. The spine's a little bit rough, but otherwise it's good. And, and this, will go, this goes for about 220 bucks. Mm -hmm. bucks. Number one uh, is also by Coltrane, but not by John. It's by Alice. Ah, it, it. It's, uh, it's Huntington Ashram Monastery. Um, which is uh, where a place where she spent increasing amounts of time, and she you got deep into Buddhism as as uh, as as the 70s progressed. This is an excellent record. It it is it contains all of the things that were great about Alice's work before she, in my view, got kind of wacky and out there as a, as the early 70s progressed. This is from 1972. And there's still lots of her lovely bluesy playing on here. There's some of that great ethereal sort of harp and piano and, and you know, kind of swirling, um, just just soundscapes almost. Anyway, it's hard to find as as are most uh, Alice records. I, the funny thing is, I probably have a record which is even rarer and scarcer than this, which is my copy of Patah the El Daoud, very early pressing of that. Weirdly, you can't find it for sale anymore, that particular pressing I have. Um, and, and the median price is actually quite low, but I'm sure if one were to come up, it yeah. would, you know, like we were talking about before. So, yes. yeah, so there we are. So of those, so those are, um, those are the top 10, mostly impulses. The, if you go down to the next 10, it's probably almost all contemporary. So, oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, I think I have, a, a Swedish jazz records, uh, at least 15, 20, I think if I go down, uh, obviously it's the, the easiest stuff that I have acquired and, and found, found for, for great prices and stuff like that. Okay, we're on the home stretch. So we have one yeah. record to discuss. So I who, think it's, who, is who it my turn? Uh, I, I think it is. Uh, and we are going to talk about Beatles. We are. 1963, this is the debut, Please Please Me. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what to say about this. Um, I mean, everything uh, that can be said about Beatles has been said, I guess. This is, uh, to go straight to what I think about this, this is not my favorite uh, Beatles record. I mean, Please Please Me and Love Me Do, uh, great songs, but uh, I I don't know. The first two, maybe three Beatles records is not really my cup of tea. Still great. I mean, they are three out of five, but the last, the the the, the rest of it is five out of five six out of five maybe um so so i just want to talk a little bit about the pressing because i have been well i don't think yeah yeah uh, stop me if i you heard it before but but uh, i've been on a huge sort of beatles search i've been searching for the best um the best possible pressings of beatles records the best sounding pressings of the beatles records and I, it came down to uh, the MoFi box set, which I got. And that was released 1981 or 82. And the BC-13 box sets that were uh, issued in uh, the UK, Germany, Holland, Sweden, France, I think. And I got a hold of the Swedish press. So I have done shootouts of... Um, the BC 13 box set and the MoFi box sets. So this is from the B, the the uh, BC 14, uh, 13. And they sound terrific. Like I almost started crying when I listened to uh, some of the, the uh, like Sergeant Pepper from the MoFi box set. Mm. It's uh, like listening to it for the first time. It's so damn good. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's your take on on uh, please please me? 
Uh, well, this, so this, just in terms of pressing, so this is like a 63, um, it's not the original first pressing, but it's, it's the one, if you look it up on Discogs, it's the very first pressing that appears in the listing. Oh, okay. Um, but it's, but it is acknowledged as a reissue. It's not, you know, as you know, once you get into like these sort of deep cuts on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 uh, or, or the deep conversation about, uh, um, Beatles pressings, you're talking about tax codes and, you know, where, where, the yeah, yeah. And yeah is on the on the part anyway so it's a very early pressing i think it sounds really great and I, mm -hmm. I i this is one another area where i really wanted to get um good pressings of some of these of some of those early beatles records so a, a year or two ago i kind of went after them um i'm glad i did then because it'd be more expensive now i really like this record you know you listen to this record you think you know these guys could be pretty big you know uh the the uh um uh, side two's got the two big uh, sorry side one's got the two big hits but side two, I think, is just full of bangers all the way through. The, considering, I think it's a two-track recording, whatever it is, it's like the yes. sound is, is just great. But what strikes me about this record more than anything is just the energy is just overflowing. Like, I, I was kind of ripping the Sonny Rollins record for being slack and lacking oxygen. This is the total opposite. This is yeah. just exuberance, just bursting out of the speakers. Like, absolutely overwhelming you, right? And even that, and there's some, there's some, you know, there's some pretty dire stuff on here, like, misery anna um you know chains i like I, I these are not particularly great songs i don't think great renditions um there are some great songs and great renditions on here uh, but but that first i think the first time it's a bit weak but even the, even so like the like the just the the energy and the authenticity and the excitement just coming out of it um a chemistry i guess is a single word i would use yes is so obvious so and again it's always sort of hard to sort of think objectively about a beatles record they're kind of like bigger than records you know what i mean um but uh but yeah i, I mean i i that's what i feel you, you could tell that these guys were an unstoppable force at that point even if this was not there as you say by any distance their best record so yeah but in 1963 nothing um uh, sounded like this i guess no. uh, and they still i mean if, if if you had to pick between stones and and beatles i would take beatles all day long uh in a heartbeat i think that even this record runs loops around yeah I, they're all considered to be rivals but i would say the stones don't even really start to hit their stride until the beatles are really in the downward spiral you know yes. I mean, were the Beatles ever in a downward spiral? I don't know. But the, but they the Stones don't really start being good until you get to like 68, 69, you know. I mean, until then, there's great moments, right? But nothing, but not consistently high quality and some really bad records in there too, right? Or or, or, or not so great. But the Beatles never put out a bad record and this is, nope. uh, this is pretty good. Okay, so our very yeah, last record awesome. we're going to talk about is lush life by john coltrane i have an extraordinarily undistinguished not particularly good sounding original jazz classics not one of the early 80s original jazz classics which sound great mine is like from like 1990 something it doesn't sound particularly good um it's got you know it's got the barcode in the back so ojc's are great but you need to get those early 80s ones it's one of these albums released by one of his labels after he left the label so it's released yep. in 61 same time actually as the bridge funnily enough roughly around the same time but the, but the recordings are all several years earlier in the, in the in the later 50s and there are three different sessions there's the trio with earl may and art taylor he's got this quintet with 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 uh, some of the, his miles davis associations like garland and, and 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 paul chambers um donald bird's on there on one track so on judy heath and all of these tracks are recorded in the six months or so just after he'd gotten clean in fact the, the the last track, I think, was just recorded a week or so after he'd finished getting clean in May of, of, of 57, um, when okay. he fired him because he was a junkie and a drunk and he had to go back to uh, Philadelphia and sort his life out. And he just goes cold turkey and then gets and just gets his life back on the rails and then goes on the great thing. So this is right after that. And they're also being recorded around the time that he's doing the sort of apprenticeship with, uh, with Monk. But he's got that six month stand with Monk in the latter part of 57. And so he's rapidly developing here. The sheets of sound thing, which would show up in, in giant steps and so on a year or two later, you're hearing bits of it here, but it's not fully articulated in, in any way. It's this kind of interregnum between being fired by Miles, getting his shit together, and then getting rehired by Miles. And all these tracks kind of come in that six to eight month period. Um, so it's so historically, it's a, it'd be an interesting document. Um, and I, I side one, I think, is are the three tracks for the trio, which I think are pretty good. They, they, it's 
it's kind of unfortunate there is no piano, but but as some people say, well, you get to hear it without a piano, which you don't usually, which is kind of interesting. But for me, the, what's great about this record is side two, in particular, Lush Life, um, which is uh, which is just is it's gorgeous. It kind of it, it looks forward to some of the stuff he would do in the '60s, like this uh, the kind of the big fanfare opening. It's a little bit like I Love Supreme, some stuff that Pharaoh Sanders would do later. Playing is great. Um, Donald Byrd is great. Like that one track is why you, I think you, why you buy this record. I Hear a Rhapsody is also a great track on side two. Side two, I think is better than side one. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's, and it's one of the better records he put out on Prestige, I would say. So mm -hmm. um, definitely worth picking up. Um, and again, as I say, historically interesting because it's, it's in that, in that interregnum, the, the in, in between miles periods. Right. It's his 1920s and 1930s between the two wars, as it were. Right. <laughs> so, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think it's great. I, I, I've had it. It's one of um, the, the records that I've had for the longest time of uh, my uh, Coltrane collection. And, and um, I don't think that there is a single Coltrane recording that is not at least interesting um, because I just love his tone. But I think that you said it. It's it's a. It's a great, great uh, record, and I hadn't thought of of uh, that that he recorded this uh, during that time period. That's super interesting. So I, I'm going to go back to it and see if I can sort of hear uh, hear that. Have you ever read uh, Lewis Porter's book on Coltrane? You must have done, eh? Uh, I have some Coltrane books, but I'm so, I'm lousy at remembering what the author's names are. Uh, maybe. Well, that's, I mean, if you're interested in Coltrane's chronology and musical development, like that's mm -hmm. that, I mean, he's a musicologist and he separates, a, but he, cha he separates out chapters. Some chapters are very specifically about mu super musical music nerd stuff. And then there's more sort of historical sequential kind of chapters. Uh, but that's but Lewis Porter's is a book to look at um, if, if, uh, if you're interested in, in like what that period is like. Okay. I have a lot of books up here. So that's yeah. why I'm looking at. Yeah, you're the book guy, exactly. I, I, I've got <laughs> a few here. Hang on, I'll just, I'll just, it's right here. I'll just, I'll just grab it, show it to you. It's um. Yeah. Yes, it's, yes, it's, I have it. Yes, yes. Yeah. I this, don't this, think this I've read book. that from from start to finish actually, because I, I think I got hung up on some of the more theoretical uh, parts. Yeah, of, you you have to you have to you. It's a book. It's a book to dip into, not to go all the way through. Um, I. Oh, okay. I so okay so now we're going to do our um our our last little our little coda here we're yeah. going to our, our random so so i'll tell you i'm gonna first of all i'm going to give you the ability to share your screen hang on uh make i'm gonna make you the co-host there we go okay so now you should be able to share your so if you can pull up your discogs and then share your screen and then just press random okay. and we'll and, and we'll talk and, are, you, are you familiar with how to do that there we go do you see it now Yes, yes. So now you go go to your go to your collect go to your collection. And then and then just click on random item. Oh, Derek in the Domino's <laughs> concert. So close <laughs> one. This this is I, I think uh, as you can see here, I logged it 10 years ago. Oh yeah. I don't think I've played it since I logged it actually. <laughs> been that long and and uh well that it's funny because i have since all the rumors and and accusations on of uh, uh, clapton has came, uh, come out i have actually taken a step away from clapton and uh, the stuff that he has has uh, done i mean the, the derrick and the dominoes record is is fantastic and i have that uh, obviously and i listen to it um but his solo stuff i, I have a, whole, a little bit of a hard time listening to it actually now yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really like his. I, his he, he, there's a few good moments in his solo stuff, but for me, I'm, I'm quite happy to take the Clapton of, uh, of uh, Blind Faith, Cream, and Yardbirds, and just leave it at that. Um, to be yeah. honest, which is still pretty good, pretty good output. But yeah, I, I agree. I haven't felt super motivated to like dig into Eric Clapton's catalog extensively in recent years either. But, uh, but that's a good track list, good uh, set list there though. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, kind of fun pick. I guess. Uh, All right. So uh, I'll stop share the sharing. Okay, now I'll share my screen. And now can I find, where is uh, my Discogs? Uh, let's try that. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so let's go with random item. 
<laughs> Excellent. Chomsky beat. This is so. I have there's a there's a little niche um, uh, part of my collection which is which is really kicking '80s gay club music, and this fits right in there. And this is, I mean, it's a great record by anybody's stretch, uh, by anybody's standard. Um, but of course, the big hit here is Small Town Boy, right? Which, uh, do you know okay. that? No, uh, no, no, no. I've never heard, I don't think I've ever heard uh, Bronski Beat. Not not intentionally, at least. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, so no, uh, Small Town Boy is, well, it's just an iconic um, uh, 80s song. First of all, like in terms of like synth pop from the 80s, like this is, uh, this it's one of the greatest synth pop songs ever. And it's also still a huge gay anthem because it's a story of a guy growing up, in, as it says, in a small town. You know, he, he's basically he's, he's not treated well. And he's kind of he's standing on the train station as a platform escaping to the big city. But that's essentially the kind of the plot. Um, but it's a fantastic song and the vocal delivery is amazing. And, and then the, and it's one of the better um, sort of synth pop songs you're ever going to hear. So yeah. Yeah, cool. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, and I, I got five years ago, it says, so I've had it for a while. I haven't played it much lately, but it's excellent. Yeah. So how, how, uh, when, when did you start to, to um, when did you start to log your sort of? Uh, yeah, about, your... actually about, uh, about uh, five years ago, actually, is when I, oh, okay. when I um, really got, I, I mean, I had some records, well, some <laughs> records before then. Um, and, uh, but then I, when, it, I was, when the volume was starting to get high, I was thinking, you know, there must be a way to. I hadn't really been on, you know, in the VC or anything like that. So it was a bit of a journey of discovery, but yeah, then it was, uh, and then it was a rabbit hole like, as these things are. <laughs> so my bank balance doesn't thank me, but. Oh uh, shit, it doesn't, man, oh man. Right. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that was, that was kind of fun. We'll have to, we'll have to do the random thing again. Maybe we'll do more. Of yeah, that. definitely. That was, that was really fun. Yeah. And, and, uh, scary <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. okay Jonas uh this this is great and uh we'll we'll talk to you again soon and all the best to you and, and yours yeah thanks for watching everybody take care bye bye, bye.